Hey, welcome, welcome back. It's Sarah from Roadworthy. It's actually a little chilly here this morning. I guess as I was running out the door, I was like, oh my God, let me grab a shawl because I'm gonna freeze out there. Um, this is my last weekly reads from Seattle. So in a couple of days, my youngest son Gavin and I hit, hit the road. <laughs> Um, we are hopping in the van and we are driving to Iowa to drop him off at school. Um, we did this last year and we had a ton of fun. Um, it's, you know, being trapped in a vehicle with your 18 year old son for a week is it's an interesting experience because you don't uh, typically spend that much consolidated time with your older teens, right? They don't want to be with you. So it's kind of fun to, uh, to sort of be trapped with him for a week. Um, and I was a little bit surprised when he got home from school this year. And we were talking about like, how are you going to get back to school and you know, blah, 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 blah. And he was like, mom, let's, let's drive back. And I was like, okay. So um, we're taking a different route uh, than we did last year. Um, and we're, we're headed up, it's finally happening. So um, hopefully we'll share some of the, the journey with you. He's, He's not decided if he's willing to be on camera or not. <laughs> so that may, uh, you know, influence some of the content. Anyway, last week I posted a video about, um, you know, how I prepare food for a month long um, road trip like this. So I will, um, link to that below but uh, once I drop him off in Iowa then I am driving um, over to Colorado um, so I will pick my husband and my older son up in Telluride um, and then we will go through um, go to Mesa Verde uh, go through sort of four corners um, and go to the north rim of the Grand Canyon and Zion. And then I will drop them off in Las Vegas and they can fly back home. And then I will continue on in the van um, going up through uh, Nevada um, and going to Grand Basin um, National Park, which is the least visited park in the United States. So I'm kind of uh, excited about that, looking forward to it. So again, hoping to share some of those adventures. Um, so in the meantime, um, what have I been reading? Well, the first thing I read, which was accidentally for Women in Translation, is First Come Summer by Maria Heslager. Um, Maria is a Danish writer, and this is translated um, from the Danish by Mar Martin Aitken. This is beautifully translated, beautifully written. I thought this was gonna be sort of literary historical fiction. So it is about a brother and sister, um, I could not find how to pronounce their names, so I will not make an attempt here for fear of embarrassing myself on the internet. Um, but it's in um, the maybe the 12th century. There are some uh, references to Christianity coming into the community. Um, the, the sister is very much, um, I don't, I, I almost want to describe her as like a medium with Norse gods. 
and spirits, she, um, I feel like that's not the right word, but that's the word I can think of right now. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, the story starts with this brother and sister and they have an incestuous relationship. Their parents are dead. They're like 18-ish years old. Um, and the book opens with a scene of the sister trying, uh, you know, physically holding down this other woman and forcing her to drink liquid. So she, she are, so it starts with you as the reader already having the impression that this girl, young woman, is perhaps unhinged and, you know, definitely dangerous. Um, but her brother gets invited to, to join the community on a, on a raiding expedition. He's going a Viking um, to help support the community. So he, he's starting to become, you know, uh, you know, an, sort of independent, you know, recognized as an adult man. And she's not happy about that. Um, and he goes off on an expedition and comes back and announces he's getting married. Um, and she is recognizing like her position in his life and her position in the household is under threat. And um, she's going to do what she can to hang on to him, hang on to her position and her role. I thought this is going to be sort of literary historical fiction, but this book really ends in horror. <laughs> um, I, I definitely don't want to say too much, but this is definitely sort of a genre defying book. It's super interesting. Um, and again, beautifully translated. Very, it's very literary. So um, it's an interesting one. I did, I think I heard about this book. Um, I, I it got a starred review in Kirkus, and which is how I sort of got interest, introduced to it. And I haven't heard anything about it, but it's definitely, it's short, um, you know, and definitely, you know, barely 200 pages. So, you know, something worth picking up. And this is also one of those books I felt like, once I knew what happened, I felt like I needed to go back to the beginning and reread it to sort of see how the author put this together because it, it went somewhere I was not expecting it to go. And because of that, I feel like I missed stuff. Um, I just, I'm looking at these clouds. These are so cool. <laughs> um, so the next book I finished on audio was In Memoriam by Alice Wynn. I feel like this book was everywhere. Lots of people were putting this on their predictions for the Booker Prize. It was not long listed. Um, this, uh, just briefly, because again, this book has kind of been everywhere, is a um, love story <laughs> between two soldiers during World War I. And it really starts with them in boarding school with they and their friends and then goes through the war um, and, and gets into uh, the end of the war a little bit. Um, I, you know, this book was well written and I have to say at the time listening to it, I was totally engrossed, thoroughly enjoyed it, loved, loved my time with it. But, you know, once I finished and I got thinking about it, um, there are a couple things that kind of bothered me. Uh, like, I, I finally noticed, like, what bothered me. Um, one, you know, all of these characters in this book, they're sort of um, Elwood and Gaunt. The, the, there's the two of them, but then a lot of their boarding school buddies 
um, who sort of pass through their lives again during the war, but they all sort of felt generic. Um, and so there were parts where, you know, they're receiving letters, you know, so-and-so got injured, so-and-so got killed, and, and I'd be thinking to myself, now who is that? Um, and so I think what Alice Wynn was trying to do was give you this cast of characters so that, again, as they start to die, you know, you really got an appreciation for how devastating the, the war was on, on, you know, upper class British men. Um, but the characterization was not that great in this book. And I think I didn't really notice it at the time I was listening because I enjoyed that character. <laughs> um, so I didn't mind that I was seeing the same character over and over and over. Um, the other thing that came up, and, and there has been some commentary about this, is um, how, as you move through the book, I don't think that there is a single moment where Elwood or Gaunt or their relationship is criticized. I, I don't think that they're ridiculed for being homosexual or being in a relationship with one another. They're all their boarding school chums, fellow soldiers and officers, um, even some of, you know, their parents' generation, you know, is, is completely open and accepting. Um, and, and I, you know, of course that's not true, right? That's not what <laughs> the state of, of Britain was, you know, in, in, uh, the early 20th century. And it, it, like it sort of got kind of laughable um it was definitely sort of annoying and pulled you out of the story but i also can appreciate you know alice Wynn was trying to write a story about to sort of the devastation of the, the war and sort of also then trying to take on the topic of the acceptance or the prejudice against homosexuals all in the same book, like it would have been way too much. And so I think she made this choice perhaps to just have their relationship be accepted so she wouldn't have to get into that. I will post below um, January wrap up from Jen the Librarian because Jen really does go into a lot more detail of what she did and didn't like about this book um, and if you watch Jen's channel at all you know that she has done a lot of reading about World War One um, and one of the things that she talks about is how Alice Wynn in this book lifts lines scenes the outlines of characters completely on real life people. And that's not always acknowledged in the back of the book. And so Jen raised the question about where is the line between being inspired by real life people and in sort of wholesale, whole scale lifting <laughs> from from reality um, and I, I really thought that was an interesting issue to think about and I'm sure it's something that writers of historical fiction need to wrestle with a lot particularly if they're writing about people or time periods or events that are have a ton of source material like World War One you know, if you're writing about something way more obscure, it's much easier to just make things up, right? But when you have something that's so well documented, 
how, how much do you rely on the source material and how much do you can you deviate and then not be criticized for not portraying things realistically I don't know it was it was an interesting um, discussion so I again if you've read in memoriam I urge you to to look at Jen's um, video because I, I think it's it's she raises some interesting issues about historical fiction um, the next thing that I picked up is um, I wanted to not pick up something historical <laughs> I wanted to pick up something contemporary and I picked up um, The Road to Dalton by Shannon Bowring from Europa Editions. I was a little surprised to see, I think of Europa Editions as doing all translated international fiction. So I was a little surprised to see that this book is based in Northern Maine. Um, this book is about three couples, um, Trudy and Bill, and Bev and Richard, and Nate and Bridget. And Nate is the adult son of um, Trudy and Bill. And um, Trudy and Bev have been having a lesbian relationship for many, many years. This is, this is all right there in the beginning of the book. Um, and what happens is there is a fender bender. Um, I think Bev and Richard, yeah, Bev and Richard um, hit Nate and Beverly, um, or excuse me, Nate and Bridget on, on the way home from a New Year's Eve party um, in 1999. Uh, and, and that event triggers um, a series of, of happenings in the town. Um, I, I loved this book. It's one of those quiet books. It's really about this small working class town. Um, everybody knows each other. Everybody's got history with everybody else. Um, it, it totally captures that small New England town vibe. Um, you know, all, there's all these secrets. Um, you know, again, Bev and Trudy having this lesbian relationship that, that nobody seems to acknowledge. It's like this open secret. Um, you know, nobody, you don't discuss unpleasantness. You don't share feelings. You know, you, you don't wanna, you don't wanna, you know, be too emotive, you know. Um, so I just, I loved how this book captured that New England culture. I loved to these descriptions of, you know, these people in a marriage where, You know they're they're sharing a home but not really a life there's this wonderful quote I can't now read it so hang on you grow up marry a man make at least one baby work hard pay taxes and don't ask too much out of life I just that's kind of the tone and the spirit of this entire book <laughs> You know, the prose of this book actually reminded me of Ann Tyler a lot. Um, it's simple, it's not fussy, but yet it somehow really captures the spirit and the psychological insight of what's going on in these characters. So definitely, I, I super enjoyed this book. So if you sort of enjoy that Ann Tyler-esque writing, um, 
give this one a try because it's it's it I I really enjoyed it oh I got one more oh my god um I wanted something light and so I picked up the fake by Zoe Whitehall Whitehall Whittle not quite sure I didn't look up how to pronounce her name sorry Zoe um but this is a book that involves three characters, Shelby, Gibson, and Cammie. Shelby um, is suffering from profound grief um, after the death of her wife from a sudden aneurysm. And not only does Shelby have profound grief, but she also has anxiety disorder and health anxiety um, and then there's Gibson who is this you know 40 something year old guy who is really mourning um, the very very recent breakup with his wife and they both meet Cammy who is a pathological liar um, who picks up Gibson at a bar and meets Shelby at a like a grief support group and the plot goes on from there this is a really interesting book first of all I thought the descriptions of Shelby's anxiety was fantastic the descriptions of just how paralyzing her anxiety was was really well done um, this was incredibly readable like you know like you know the, the wheels are gonna fall off this bus yeah. Um, and you're just sort of waiting for like, oh my God, how's this going to end? And then what's going to happen to these two people who are already in a very vulnerable place? What's going to happen? Um, this, this book it was so, it, Cammie is so nuanced. You know, it, you, you, from that setup, you think you're just going to hate this woman but you don't you know yes you can see how she's taking advantage of these very vulnerable people but she's also in some ways helping them heal you know she gets Shelby out of the house she gets Shelby to, to start you know um, engaging in life again and she for Gibson you know, he his his self esteem is 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 profoundly shaken with the dissolution of his marriage, and you can see again, you know, Cammy just makes him feel like he's he's the cat's pajamas, um, and so it's hard it's hard to completely hate her when she helps these characters feel seen, supported, loved in ways that they are not getting from other people. Um, and, and once Shelby and Gibson sort of figure out what is going on, again, the other does a great job of having their reaction be very nuanced you know obviously they're angry but they they feel stupid right but they also feel grateful for what Cammie has done for them um, so you know they want to help her um, you know they they but they want to warn people you know they just have this very mixed response um, to, you know when this when this all comes out so you know I thought this was gonna kind of be a light fluffy summer read which is exactly what I wanted but it was it was 
way more rich in, in characterization than I was anticipating. So I, I and again, super readable. Um, I, I really, I gave this a, an enthusiastic <laughs> thumbs up. Um, and, uh, you know, another super great read. I feel like this week it was just like bangers, you know, all week. Um, so what am I currently reading? I'm currently reading a nonfiction book, The Overlooked Americans. Um, and I got, I don't even have the author written down. Oh God, sorry. Uh, I'll say no more about it and I'll, I'll save it for my next weekly wrap up. Um, and I'm also uh, listening to The Wall by uh, Marlene Haushofer. Um, and this I'll sort of describe as dystopian Walden Pond. <laughs> Um, so that's what I'm in the middle of, um, and I'll leave it here, um, and I am looking forward to bringing you my next update from On the Road. Um, so hopefully my trend of amazing books continues, um, so I'll leave it here. So thank you so much for watching if you've made it this far and I'll see you in the next one.